How does one describe a comfort game? Is it something that you can just simply boot up at any time, at any moment of the day? A game where you've got all the routes memorized and you could recite the lines of dialogue word for word. Is booting up the title screen like opening the door to an old friend, where no matter the amount of time lost or the distance gained, no familiarity is lost. I think that familiarity here is the key term. It's like a little piece of your childhood home being revisited every time you spin that disc. There's a few games that give me that hit of nostalgic dopamine. For me, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 was a snowy Christmas morning in a rundown mobile home. Paper Mario was a hot summer afternoon in my grandmother's attic while my old man watches the Yankees game from downstairs. Rival Schools is a small gathering of friends staying way past curfew on a school night because you want that salty run back. I've spent years finding myself engrossed in these games to escape my reality only for them to return the favor by bringing me back to that snapshot in time. I can almost taste the ocean-scented air of Long Island's Great South Bay every time I dropped another quarter into the Metal Slug X cab. However, I don't think that there's been a game that's carried me through each phase of my life like The Legend of Dragoon has. I've sunk countless hours into this game, I've beaten it numerous times, and every time I revisit the end credits, I make the same empty promise of never again as it just sits there on the shelf, menacingly, patiently waiting for the oath to be broken once more. I recently came into the possession of a Japanese copy of The Legend of Dragoon as a late Christmas present for my buddy Cory, and the completely irrational being that lives inside my brain thinks, yeah, this will be a good time. I can't read Japanese, I can't even be bothered to move past the first screen of Duolingo, yet I sat through 72 hours of me holding up my phone to the screen and reading the text off Google Translate's broken cipher as I slowly scrolled through the armor page. Clearly I have a tempered bond with this game, or an unhealthy obsession that's not properly being addressed, but today I want to take this a step further, I want to investigate its craftsmanship. I want to see what makes it tick, uncover the lore of its creation, chart its lineage, and study its impact on the modern gaming world. Understand why it was originally passed off as a generic JRPG, only to be heralded as a cult classic and forerunner to be remade in the eyes of its diehard fans. This is the story of one of my most beloved games of all time, and how it came to be. Before we get started, if you're new here, my name is Antichris and welcome to my channel. I primarily cover game development for most of my favorite games and will occasionally release these two minute reviews of whatever I happen to be playing during the week. If you decide that after watching this video you've really enjoyed it and would like to see more works like it, please consider subscribing and leaving a like and a comment. I would really appreciate it. I do apologize ahead of time as right when I was planning on recording, came down with this really nasty cold, so if I sound nasally, that's unfortunately why. Accompanying me today is my good buddy Corey, known around these streets as Tornado Jones. With that out of the way, let's move on to the video. Now typically I begin with a showcase of the developers, their previous works and accomplishments, etc. However, this time I want to put the game front and center first. The Legend of Dragoon is a turn-based role-playing game developed out of Sony's legendary Japan studio and was released for the PlayStation on December 2nd, 1999. It would later cross the shores to North America on June 13th, 2000 and again on January 19th, 2001 for the European Union. While most AAA studios shifted their development focus to the PlayStation 2 in the late 90s, the Legend of Dragoon still proves to be an impressive work of craftsmanship that could only be accomplished on the PlayStation 1 with beautifully pre-rendered backgrounds, fleshed out character models, and high quality CGI segments coupled with voice acting and a masterful score. The Legend of Dragoon follows the journey of one Dark Feld, a robust young man who has spent the last five years traveling the world in search of the Black Monster. A Hellion who torments the world every 18 years, raising villages in its path as it hunts for the Moonchild, a holy entity that promises to bless the world with opulence and everlasting peace. 
Like with almost any other JRPG, Dark's adventures yield him a motley crew of soldiers, entertainers, and royalty to accompany him on his voyage, which sees him participate in civil war, monarchical espionage, matters of racial divide, and the quest for revenge, all while gunning for his ultimate objective in destroying the Black Monster. What sets The Legend of Dragoon apart from its contemporaries is its unique addition battle system. Each character attacks in a specific pattern that is augmented by the rhythmic inputs of the player. Each addition begins with a base damage value that will increase depending on the number of successful inputs you enter. As you frequently execute a complete addition, the combo will level up, increasing the amount of damage dealt and or spirit points earned. More complex additions provide an added layer of difficulty by the way of the counterattack mechanic where the player will need to quickly react to a new input before the attack ends and the party member incurs damage. While only simple additions are available when you initially recruit a new party member, new additions will be unlocked as you level up, forcing the player to be an active member in battle if they want to dispatch the enemy in the most efficient manner possible. Once the characters have been graced with the privilege of hosting a Dragoon Spirit, they are able to transmute into a powerful Dragoon Warrior, giving the player access to potent spells and brutal elemental attacks. These abilities are temporary, however, and require the use of spirit points to maintain their draconic forms. These transformations are further enhanced through battle by surpassing spirit point thresholds that will effectively level up your Dragoon forms and provide extended transformation time, new spells, and the capstone ability of summoning these mythical behemoths. While dismissed by critics for being a generic ripoff of the Final Fantasy series, the game has maintained a strong cult movement and presently is one of the more desired games to see a remake judging by fan input and reaction. Interestingly enough, it was not the smash hit Sony hoped it would be when it launched in Japan. While it did manage to secure the number 2 spot behind Pokemon Gold and Silver during its first week, consumer feedback was less than positive, causing the team to rework The Legend of Dragoon for its international release, but more on that later. The development of The Legend of Dragoon is told through the handiwork of approximately 155 developers, producers, artists, musicians, so on and so forth. However, its origin story can be traced back to two individuals, Yasuyuki Hasabe and Shuhei Yoshida. Hasabe spent most of the 90s working as a battle planner for Square, notably on Final Fantasy VI and Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars though he also worked on the Japanese exclusive Hanjuku Iyu Asakai Yo Hanjuku Nare. Yoshida, on the other hand, was the premier senior publishing producer for Sony Computer Entertainment, overseeing the production of some of Sony's most legendary cornerstone content, like Crash Bandicoot, Spyro the Dragon, Gran Turismo, and Ape Escape. Impressed with his work, namely with Final Fantasy and Mario RPG, Yoshida approached Hasabe about coming over to Sony and directing his own game, an opportunity Hasabe obviously jumped at, as in 1996 he left Square to begin writing the storyline for The Legend of Dragoon under Japan Studios' banner. When development officially began, Hasabe was only allocated a small team of 10 artists and programmers, mainly due to an overlap of production as Japan Studio was also working on Ape Escape in 96 and Eco in 97. That soon changed as the needs of the project would evolve into a massive undertaking, requiring a body count of as many as 100 employees at its peak. Sony had high expectations for this game as they kept feeding more and more resources into its development, dedicating a massive $16 million for its budget, the highest that the company had for the time, and a massive war chest for any developer in the late 90s. To support this investment, Japan's studio assigned some of their best and brightest stars on the project, to include assistant director Koji Ishitani, event director Takahiro Kaminaga Yoshi, battle planner Kazuki Hayashitani, and Toshiyuki Miyata as project supervisor. For comparison's sake, while it still pales considering Final Fantasy VII's massive $40 million budget, most of the high-value projects Japan's studio churned out rarely broke the $5 million mark. Hasabe's method of designing the characters was surprisingly rudimentary. Rather than already have these characters preconceived in the mind's eye, Hasabe and art director Kenichi Iwata began with a list of letters A to N and started to fill in names for each letter, then selected the names they liked the most and began designing the characters from there. Rose and Dart were among the first characters to be drafted up, created with a more anime style in mind. Picture a rose with vibrant green hair. It's a little weird. However, Hasabe wanted to make the world look and feel as realistic as possible and opted for a low fantasy setting. 
Thus, any potential comparisons that could be made to an anime was removed, substituting bright pastel colors for more natural and earthy tones. This decision to protect the game's realism also carried over into the battle system. Magic was reserved for beasts, dragoon forms, and other mystical creatures with human characters needing to resort to traditional weapons or special elemental items. To quote Hasabe in an interview with Famitsu, quote, you lose the sense of real world if everyone can do everything. To further sell the low fantasy setting, The Legend of Dragoon used beautifully crafted CGI films to mark major milestones and lore dumps within the game, clocking in at a whopping 30 minutes of total footage. Originally, there was no plans to include any sort of CGI in the game, and instead have the polygonal character models tell the story. But as Hasabe put in an interview with Famitsu, movies are very cool to watch. So the team put in the extra effort to add these features that would typically be teased for a PlayStation 2 game. The plan was to originally reserve the use of CG scenes for dragon fights, like the assault on the Wingly Sky Fortress or the Divine Dragon using its signature attack. In their interview with Famitsu, Iwata and Hasabe talked briefly about the difficulties they faced when getting started, since the flight battles expanded to detailing the cities and areas around them, adding buildings and destroyed structures, and ultimately adding effects like smoke and ash, all while trying to ensure the lighting was just right. It's impressive in its own right, as there's really no comparison to be made with other PlayStation titles that come close to this level of detail and dedication. While by and large a Japanese-focused initiative, Sony looked outside the confines of its borders when looking for a composer. Enter one Dennis Martin, New York City native and NYU alumni with a focus in computer music and composition. Martin co-founded Hipbone Records in 1998 with a primary focus on Deep House, Blues, and Soul, and had produced the soundtracks for a few Japanese television shows, like Rasen for Fuji TV and Bluebird Syndrome under TV Asahi. Martin landed the lead composer role after submitting what would later become the title track of the series. It explodes with these long, drawn-out synths, while tribal drums blanket the background, easing you into a sort of ancient rhythm. That is until the overdriven guitars cut through and grab your attention. Martin describes the soundtrack as a sonic layering of organic, ethnic percussions and electronic elements, which was unique for a Japanese game at the time. Martin submitted this and another track in his audition to Japan Studio. With no real knowledge of what The Legend of Dragoon was or even the theme of the game, and told RPG Gamer that he was rather surprised that he was selected, as there was many composers also vying for the position with more practical know-how than he. He described the experience as unique as he'd have to often communicate via email, MP3, and FedEx whenever he wasn't in Tokyo for business. Originally, Martin was hired as the sole composer for the project, however, due to time restraints and the sheer magnitude of development, Japan Studio brought on Takeo Miratsu to help support. The duo split the work by theme, with Martin taking on most of the overworld and dungeon music, like the Forbidden Land, Ghost Ship, and Royal Capital, while Miratsu handled the battle music and character themes. You could totally see the stark contrast between the two's influences, with Miratsu leaning heavily on his roots in hard rock and pop music. Unlike most projects where the game would effectively be completed before the tracks are laid down, Martin and Miratsu created the music without knowing the setting or themes, and just wrote whatever felt right based on the feedback of the director and producer. Martin describes his thoughts on the track Ruin Celeste with Stephanie Minor of VG Kami, along with the whole unorthodox process. A track I am very fond of is Ruin Celeste. It was one of the very first pieces I composed for Legend of Dragoon, and I did it completely blind, not really knowing what kind of scene they would be building around it. So, my music was first, and then they used it as a template. When I got to see the rough cut of the scene, I was blown away when I saw the beautiful animation they had created. At that point, I knew we had something special. Martin frequently laments over the limitations of the PlayStation's hardware and its subpar memory capacity, preventing him and Miratsu from being able to record on anything other than internal synthesizers and MIDI samples though he takes most pride in what was ultimately the final track he recorded for the game, If You Still Believe, 
the end credits theme. It's got this eclectic mix of acoustic guitars, hand percussions, and saxophone, blending a melancholy ballad overlaid with Elsa Raven's vocals. It's hauntingly eerie, yet draws you in like a siren song. It's beautiful. It was also the last track to get composed. Unlike the rest of the score, this was the only track that I got a full production with live musicians, real strings, and the beautiful vocals from my dear friend Elsa Raven. I recorded the string section and guitars in Tokyo, and then came back to New York and did the bass, percussion, sax, and vocals. We mixed it in New York City. I think that song fits well into the vibe of the game and can also stand on its own. The opening CG movie music is that first demo that I handed in, in its original form. The duo was ultimately given a lot of creative freedom with the tracks they produced. Instead of tailoring the game to a specific genre, Martin and Muratsu relied more on their intuition to create a mood and a vibe for each of the settings. Martin attributes this talent to his unorthodox nature as a game composer, breaking away from the preconceived ideas of what game soundtracks should sound like and instead developed his own palette for The Legend of Dragoon. When the game was finally released, there was a considerable amount of hype surrounding the launch. The Legend of Dragoon was Japan Studio's first foray into the RPG space, with both fans and critics eagerly waiting just to see what Sony had been cooking up the last three years. Within its first week, The Legend of Dragoon sold just over 160,000 units, and topped off at 280,000 units by the end of 1999. However, sales allegedly dipped rather quickly thereafter. Famitsu gave the game a 31 out of 40, 3 8s and a 7, citing the impressive graphics and CGI sequences being the most appealing aspects of the game, but complained that the battle sequences take too long and having to use the pocket station to gather more gold and rare items was just too tedious and forced. The Sony Pocket Station was a beefed up memory card for the PlayStation equipped with an LCD screen that was originally marketed as a personal digital assistant or PDA for you young folk out there. It offered infrared communication capabilities, a real-time clock, flash memory, and its own sound chip. The Pocket Station could not only record saved data, but also play specialized applications and minigames derived from one of its 84 compatible games that released from 1999 to 2002. Plans for its release in the US and EU markets were scrapped due to manufacturing issues and failing to meet the demands in Japan. If you're getting Dreamcast VMU vibes from this, you're not far off. Besides money problems, Fans complained that the game was just hard, really hard, almost to the point where it was unplayable. The health pools of some major enemies were just too high for players to casually run through, resulting in Shuhei Yoshida taking matters into his own hands and personally managed the localization of the US release. Through his supervision, major changes include removing certain spells that the enemy can cast, enacting a global stat reduction amongst all minor mobs and bosses of 25% or more, swapping the attack and counterattack buttons, increasing the amount of damage dealt to enemies while using magic items, increasing the gold and item drop rates by three times that of the Japanese release, largely due to the absence of the pocket station in outside regions, and changing the requirements of surviving a scripted encounter during the hero competition. In the Japanese version, letting the enemy kill you before he gets to use his final attack forces a game over screen, where in the US it just continues the story. Japan studios were sweating in the six months from the game's initial launch. After going $60 million in the hole, they failed to make back what they had dumped into development. Everything was riding on the Western region's feedback, putting even more pressure on the localization team. Luckily, Yoshida listened to the concerns of the Japanese fanbase, and through the quote-unquote international version, was able to recoup the gap of development costs through the US sales alone. The Legend of Dragoon would go on to sell 980,000 copies in the US by 2007, and later proved to be a powerhouse for the PlayStation 3 when Sony launched it as a PS1 classic for the PlayStation Network, where it stood in the top 5 best-selling games for 3 months straight, outselling iconic titles like Final Fantasy VIII and IX, Resident Evil 2, Metal Gear Solid, 
and at one point even toppling the king of the PS1, Final Fantasy VII. Critic response was rather middling. Game Pro's E. coli, are we serious? Gave the game a perfect score, praising its powerful story, great cast of characters, and one of the most inventive battle systems for a JRPG at the time, even going as far as to call it the Final Fantasy Killer. Peter Bartholo of GameSpot didn't share E. coli's sentiment, brushing off Sony's first foray into the genre as a telltale sign of inexperience, demoting The Legend of Dragoon to a highly generic RPG. Its story was criticized for its Super Sentai-esque formula, with characters essentially color-coded for their respective ranger status, with little or no personality outside of their respective tropes. Johnny Liu of Game Revolution went as far as to infer that Japan Studios falsely advertised the game by only showing off its CGI segments in commercials and its box art, which, looking back at old footage and the actual case, is simply untrue, but I digress. Lou would make similar assertions to his industry counterparts that the characters have no personality and criticize the addition system for lacking a risk-reward mechanic, and would further accuse Japan Studios of ripping off Square Enix's combo system for Vagrant Story. Regardless of the smear campaign certain journalists try to run, it ranks amongst the top 20 highest rated games by users for the PlayStation on Metacritic, and even saw a novel and manga adaptation following its success. The success spurred a sequel sometime in the late 2000s following Yoshida's departure from Japan Studios, but with key members of the original staff split up and assigned to different projects, The Legend of Dragoon 2 unfortunately was canned for undisclosed reasons. Following the release of The Legend of Dragoon, Shuhei Yoshida would be promoted to Vice President of Sony Computer Entertainment of America, and eventually served as the President of Sony Interactive Entertainment Worldwide Studios from 2008 to 2019. He has since stepped down to act as the head of the Independent Developer Initiative for Sony Interactive Entertainment. Yasuyuki Hasabe, on the other hand, had effectively disappeared from the games industry following his magnum opus in 2000. Fans curious of his next move spent years trying to track down the elusive designer until a 2021 article by an Italian games publication Qjin.info revealed that Hasabe had left the video games industry completely and is currently serving as the senior vice president for a security firm called Solution Systems, a company providing services for IT security, video communications, and renewable devices. The desire for a remake has been frequently championed by its diehard fanbase. Interest first arose when Sony Computer Entertainment renewed the trademark back in 2012, though it was due to a planned launch on the PlayStation Network. Sony's acquisition of Bluepoint Games also breathed some hope into its most devout, since the developer is known for their remasters of PlayStation classics like Shadow of the Colossus and Gravity Rush, and most notably known for its work on the Demon Souls remake. Unfortunately, it was confirmed by Bluepoint president Marco Thrust that the studio was instead working on a brand new IP. To this day, fans beg Sony for the chance to relive their childhood through a modern day lens, with the most recent glimmer of hope being dashed within the last six months after Sony revealed a beloved RPG series would make a return, only for a remaster of Chrono Cross and a new entry into the Valkyrie Profile series. This is unfortunate considering that the fanbase is frequently baited by would-be trolls and the occasional April Fool's post. It does, however, beg the question, should The Legend of Dragoon even be considered for the remake service? What would it look like? I'm sort of split on the concept. For me, I've taken a serious liking to the Xenoblade combat system, where party members can act freely with a few exceptions. Perhaps have the additions themselves act as a sort of special attack or ailment-inducing ability. But at the same time, I'm also comfortable with what we have. Maybe a fresh coat of paint would be nice. The Legend of Dragoon could do fine with a modern facelift, but it doesn't necessarily need it, as the gameplay and story still holds up for the most part. The Legend of Dragoon stands the test of time as a near-universally loved RPG by many fans of the genre. My personal journey with the game began in the electronic section of a Kmart, taking it home one Friday night and absolutely having a blast with it, until I realized I didn't have a memory card. Those three days of leaving my PlayStation on overnight were anxiety inducing. Beyond that, the game easily lands near the top of my list of guilty pleasures, and even throughout the years with the numerous times that I've beaten this game, I never really get tired of it. There's always a new challenge or approach with The Legend of Dragoon that I can take on. Even with the story being labeled as cheesy or flawed, I still genuinely have a good time with my Dragon Power Rangers, as they've been affectionately called. 
Though the Japanese version is quite difficult. That I will concede. I don't know about going back to that one. Yet, since that fateful night in 2002, The Legend of Dragoon has always been a faithful companion, following me through my journeys, both ups and downs in life, across the United States and back. It was always reassuring that I had a little piece of home that was no more than an arm's reach away. I want to leave this piece with one of the final thoughts that Dennis Martin gave VG Kami in his most recent interview that I believe sums up the legacy of The Legend of Dragoon. 20 years is a long time. And for it to have so much impact is a testament to the hard work that we all put into it. Good storytelling and music are eternal, and what you listen to or what you play when you are young will stay with you forever. And I am thrilled to have played a small part in that. Hey guys, if you've made it to the end of this video, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch a little piece of me and my thoughts. If you've enjoyed my work here and you'd like to see what I come up with next, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. I've also got a Patreon where you can see work in progress updates and plans for future videos, as well as exclusive voting power on content down the road. Thank you to the Okami Council for your continued support at the supporter tier level. And I'd also like to give a shout out to Tornado Jones for helping me with this video and really being the catalyst for this piece. I really appreciate it. In other news, if you happen to be in the Boston area between April 21st through the 24th, I'll be at PAX East with the Megavisions team covering the event, so if you see us running around, definitely give us a holler. With that said, I'm going to take some time getting some two-minute reviews out before I begin the next major project, so be on the lookout for that. In the meantime, I've got some other videos on game development like the incredibly rare Cube of War for the GameCube and the indie darling Katana Zero, so definitely check those out. Until next time, be well.